try and emphasize a few different points as well as some radiographic findings. We'll be discussing pulmonary interstitial disease, in particular radiographic and HRCT evaluation. Let me start first with the unknowns. Give you a couple of seconds here on each one to take a look at the radiograph or the CT image, generate a description in your head and a differential diagnosis, with most likely diagnosis leading that list. And I'll go through these as we go through the talk. Here's number two. Do you need a biopsy to make this diagnosis or can we make it presumptively? Number three. Based on your description of these findings, is this potentially reversible disease or is this irreversible? And that's the end of that. Two patients with the same diagnosis. Number four, this ought to look really familiar. And last one. Describe these opacities to yourself, and then what's compelling about this particular image? <clears throat> okay, let me talk first a little bit of anatomy. If you want to understand interstitial disease, it's important to recognize some basic architecture of the lung. You can broadly classify the lung into airspace components and interstitial components. The interstitial component is outlined here in red in a diagrammatic fashion. These uh, red lines corresponding to the peripheral interstitium, where that interstitium is located in the immediate area of the visceral pleura or subpleural regions of lung. It's called the subpleural interstitium. That will invaginate at fairly irregular intervals throughout the lung to form interlobular septa. And then that connective tissue septa is contiguous with the bronchovascular interstitium as it's reaching the periphery of the lung through the intralobular interstitium. So the areas between your red lines here are diagrammatically at least, a secondary pulmonary lobule. And I'm going to go over this in just a little bit more detail because a basic understanding of lobular anatomy is necessary for really appreciating how to interpret HRCT. You can see that the intralobular interstitium connects the peripheral interstitial network with the bronchovascular bundles that again coalesce centrally here with the central bronchovascular interstitium. So the whole connective tissue framework of the lung, lung is contiguous. Pretty typical pattern, airspace pattern. In order to understand interstitial disease, I'd like to contrast it with airspace disease. This is a, a pathologic specimen here in a patient who died of bronchopneumonia. You can see a fairly typical appearance of airspace disease. This is a secondary lobule right here, unaffected. And I'll go over this again in just a couple of minutes. This is pneumonia filling the lobules here. And you can see how the pneumonia coalesces individual lobules filling with pus. Some, area, some areas are involved. You can see a bronchus right in the center. Some areas are relatively spared, other areas involved. So a rather patchy disease, and you can see the same thing on CT scanning. That's really what HRCT is about, is trying to understand the pathologic representation of disease with very thin section imaging. You can almost see a couple lobules here filling with pneumonia. In this case, this is mycobacterial disease. Several other lobules filling and small nodules that are actually in the center of lobules, hence the name central lobular nodules. Features of airspace disease, which will contrast with interstitial disease, a lobar or segmental distribution. A lot of these diseases are distributed along airways, so they b obey uh, airway and lung anatomy. They tend to be fairly poorly marginated processes. For those of you who are looking closely at this side, you may say, wait a minute, this looks pretty marginated to me. The reason why it is poorly marginated, it's a radiographic description. You can imagine opacities here and here summing over a two-dimensional image if the x-ray beam is coming in this direction and one opacity tends to obscure the borders of the other opacities, so airspace diseases tend to be poorly marginated as a result. They tend to coalesce with one another, so over time this area will merge with this area to give you a low bar pneumonia, and they tend to be characterized by the air bronchogram, which you actually see examples of here. Central lobular bronchus filled with air, surrounded by pus. Interstitial disease looks different. It's characterized mostly by linear nodular and reticular elements. The linear elements often are interlobular septal thickening, so that connective tissue framework peripherally thickens up. And you can actually see that in this, histo or this pathologic example. Thickened interlobular septa here, and on the CT scan you can nicely see thickened interlobular septa. So this is what we're after on HRCT, is to try and recapitulate what the pathologist already knows, look at their disease distributions, and translate that to a non-invasive way of making the diagnosis. Interlobular interstitial, th interlobular interstitial thickening, small nodules, subpleural edema, so that uh, those red lines that I showed you on an earlier slide, when that connective tissue framework thickens up, it can give you edema in the subpleural regions of the lung. 
crisscrossing lines in the intralobular interstitium, thickening of the peribronchiolar tissues, and then honeycombing. These are the major features that you'd look for on a radiograph or a CT scan to diagnose an interstitial process. And of course, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, there's a lot of merging between interstitial and airspace disease because many pathologies will affect both compartments. All you can do is try and to see which compartment is most predominantly affected on a radiograph. That way you can generate your differential diagnosis appropriately. A couple of examples of interstitial opacity. We'll start with small nodules. These are two patients with Miller TB. This is mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease. No way to tell looking at the radiograph. You can see a little bit of lymphadenopathy here as well. Multiple small nodules right in the range of about two millimeters, maybe slightly bigger, sometimes a little bit smaller. That's what you're looking for when you're talking about Miller disease, and I know Rick showed a case of that in the last talk here usually rather diffusely distributed. Upper, mid, and lower lungs relatively equally affected, maybe a little basal or predominant due to the hematologous mechanism. Interstitial opacity, a linear abnormality on radiography. This is a pretty simple case of a patient in congestive heart failure. You can nicely see thickened interlobular septa periphery. These are Curley's lines. That's what Curley's lines are, both A and B lines, and really C lines as well. Interlobular septal thickening, which you can see nicely on the close-up here. Lines that are peripheral to and contact the uh, pleural space, usually at a right angle, one to two centimeters long. Just a manifestation of something infiltrating through the interstitium. It's quite commonly heart failure, quite commonly tumor. Those are probably the two biggies for causing interlobular septal thickening, as we'll see. And then finally, when the lines that are created on a radiograph in a patient with interstitial disease start to crisscross, you'll get intersecting opacities or reticular opacity. That's what we mean when we say reticular, net-like. This is a patient with low lung volumes, peripheral, subpleural and basilar predominant reticulation, which you can see a little bit better on this image here. You can see lines going at different angles intersecting one another. So when you take the, or the description of reticular opacity, you add to it the distribution, subpleural, basilar predominant with low lung volumes, now you're getting closer to making a diagnosis. This is usual interstitial pneumonia slash IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And this is a similar case to your first unknown. first unknown I showed you was a case of UIP. Honeycombing is also a manifestation of interstitial lung disease, quite commonly usual idiopathic interstitial pneumonia like UIP, not invariably UIP, other diseases will cause honeycombing. We're looking for th relatively thick wall. This is fairly thick wall for how small it is. In terms of cavities, it's not that thick wall, but for a little cystic space, fairly thick wall compared to para paraseptal emphysema, which you probably saw last hour. Subpleural and basal are predominant. You can see the disease predominates, predominates down near the diaphragm here relatively thick wall little spaces like this that tend to uh, share walls with one another and stack up on one another. This is what honeycombing looks like on a radiograph and with that distribution it's a characteristic of usual interstitial pneumonia which is a pretty common idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, one of your major interstitial lung diseases. So differential diagnosis of interstitial lung disease is really extensive. Probably 200 plus diseases but we can concern ourselves with a few major categories. Alphabet soup, idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, some of which I'm going to show you now. Infections, the two biggies being TB and viruses also cause an interstitial type appearance on chest radiography. Pulmonary edema, certain non-infectious inflammatory lesions, some of which you saw in the last talk, sarcoidosis and hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And then tumor, in particular lymphangetic carcinomatosis. Those are kind of some of the bigger interstitial lung processes you're likely to encounter in practice and you're likely to encounter in Louisville uh, as well. So coming back again to understand a little bit about lobular anatomy, this is very important for understanding HRCT. This is a diagrammatic example of a secondary lobule. So in terms of scale, we're talking about one to two centimeters or so overall in size. This is a visceral pleura, subpleural interstitium or collagen and connective tissue fiber network invaginates to form an interlobular septum. Area between these two septa is a secondary pulmonary lobule. It's supplied by its own artery and own bronchus, referred to as central lobular artery and bronchus, which will divide repeatedly until finally you get to terminal bronchioles, which will supply individual asini. You probably have about 4,000 or so individual alveoli in one of these asini, maybe 6 to 12 on average asini per lobule. Gives you an idea about the size of what we're talking about. When this space fills up with pus, that's how we get pneumonias. That's what bronchopneumonias and lobar pneumonias will look like. When you see nodules or interstitial opacity on a chest radiograph and CT, the way we describe these abnormalities are going to be with reference to the secondary lobule. So it's important to have an understanding of this anatomy. In the interlobular septa, this is where the pulmonary veins run. I'll show you a micrograph of a CT scan that outlines this anatomy. This is a central lobular artery coming into a secondary lobule, central lobular bronchus, 
interlobular septum, and you can see within the septum, pulmonary vein right here running within the septum. So this area here is a secondary lobule. Nodules may conglomerate around this area, their central lobular, when they're basically distributed throughout the secondary lobule, both in the center and the periphery. Those are random nodules. And when they tend to be clustered along bronchovascular structures, along here and along the septa, that's paralymphatic, our three major divisions, some of which you heard about last hour, and I'll show you a few more cases during this uh, talk as well. So interstitial lung disease, how does it look on an HRCT? This is more or less a diagrammatic summary of the kind of findings you'll see with interstitial lung opacity. Interlobular septal thickening, thickened straight lines, so a linear abnormality on CT or radiography. Reticulation, crisscrossing lines forming a net-like pattern often within the secondary lobule. You can see this area between these two septa would be diagrammatically equivalent to a secondary lobule. It's reticulation. Nodules, nodules may be classified as random when they're diffusely distributed throughout the lobule and throughout the lung, along bronchi, along septa, uh, along bronchovascular structures in the center of the lobule as well. They may have branching configurations, not so much an interstitial abnormality then, that's very characteristic of airway-related infections, so-called tree and bud. Sometimes the nodules will be predominantly along interlobular septa and bronchovascular structures as well. That's pretty typical of perilymphatic diseases. Honeycombing, as I mentioned, small cysts, usually with relatively thick walls, one to three millimeters, subtle regions of lung stacking on one another. Those are features you can use to distinguish from something like paraseptal emphysema, which tends not to stack up on itself. Parenchymal bands and subtle lines you may hear about, they're very nonspecific. Parenchymal band is a thick linear structure perpendicular to pleura, and the subtle line is a linear structure that parallels the pleural surface, initially described mostly in asbestosis, but you'll see them in a lot of diseases. So let's see how these HRCT findings play out with some of the more common interstitial diseases, particularly idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. Usual interstitial pneumonia, or UIP, is a patchy basal or subpleural irregular process. That's what you're going to see on pathology. That's what you're going to see on radiography. It starts with intralobular interstitial thickening, so collagen's getting laid down in that small fiber network inside the secondary lobule, and then it progresses to involve interlobular septa and more central structures as well. Eventually, you'll see honeycomb lung. The pathologist, of course, will see it before we do, but once you see it, then you can get a little bit more specific about your diagnosis. It's a fibrosing process, so you're going to see traction bronchiectasis. Bronchi are going to be popped open. They're going to be pulled open by the surrounding fibrosis. You'll see architectural distortion as well. These are all features that are very important for making this diagnosis. You will see areas of ground glass opacity, but it tends to occur in areas of fibrosis. So really, it just represents fibrosis that's below the limit of HRCT. It's just reticulation and collagen deposition that's just a little bit too small for HRCT to resolve as a distinct structure. And, of course, HRCT is superior to the chest radiograph, both for detecting the disease as well as characterizing the disease, and it does have some correlation with functional status as well. How useful is HRCT when you're looking at patients with uh, usual interstitial pneumonia? Well, it does allow you to distinguish active and reversible diseases, and this is an important point I'll emphasize, from irreversible fibrosis. Once you make a confident diagnosis of UIP, that patient will usually not undergo lung biopsy or shouldn't, and chances are anything the clinician does for the patient is really not going to alter their outcome. As opposed to reversible diseases that often get biopsy and they get treated heavily with steroids, and if steroids don't work, it may be higher immunosuppression than that. So it's very important to distinguish these processes. HRC to appearance is helpful for predicting who's going to respond to treatment and who's not going to respond. And when you're not sure what you're looking at, HRCT is useful for showing the surgeon where he or she should biopsy. You want to stay in the areas of ground glass that's relatively unassociated with fibrosis and stay out of the areas of coarse fibrosis because you'll just get nonspecific end-stage lung as your diagnosis. That's not going to help change the patient's management at all. So a couple of cases here of what usual interstitial pneumonia will look like. On your right there is an early case, and I use the word early in quotation marks because this is still a pretty late stage process, pathologically speaking. It's just early to the radiologist because we don't definitely see honeycombing yet. And this is where we'd certainly like to intervene upon patients. If you have a chance to affect their management, it would potentially be at this stage. Subpleural, coarse, linear, and reticular opacities. You can see lines here, and if you look real close, this probably won't come on in your handout at all, but you can see small little wispy lines here in the secondary lobules. That's intralobular interstitial thickening. So it's collagen, abnormal collagen being deposited along the interstitium within the secondary lobule. That begins to summate, and you'll see this predominating in the subpleural regions in the lower lobe, costophrenic sulci first. When you see that particular pattern, you can be pretty sure that you're dealing with usual interstitial pneumonia if you see associated honeycombing. This is probably the most far gone case of honeycombing you're going to come across. Multiple cysts, sharing walls, stacking up 
on each other. This is a prone scan, so this is way down in the costophrenic sulcus, right where you want to see it to say, give a confident diagnosis of usual interstitial pneumonia. In this case, usual interstitial pneumonia would be in your differential, just before we see honeycombing, but you'd have to think about reversible diseases as well. Probably the biggest one being nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis. So when you see this type of HRCT appearance, the case on your right, those are patients who are usually going to go on to lung biopsy, or if they have an associated collagen vascular disease, it'll be presumed that they have NSIP, and they're going to be treated for it. We hope to see a treatment response. We know when we see this particular process, this patient is not going to get biopsy. This patient's not going to do well. Their prognosis is more or less laid out as a very poor two to five year survival. It's typical for patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. HRCT appearance is very key for making the diagnosis and managing the patient. When you see honeycombing in the clear distribution, that's when you pull the trigger on UIP. If you don't see it, you've got to keep a little wider differential. Let's contrast UIP with nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis or NSIP. Initially introduced as an IP or idiopathic uh, interstitial pneumonia, not otherwise classifiable as one of the other alphabet soups, but it's really kind of merging into its own diagnosis now. It's characterized by alveolar wall inflammation and some fibrosis with normal interspersed lung, but it's a homogeneous process. It looks very different on biopsy than does UIP. It's been subdivided depending on how much cellular component it is. It could look very cellular on biopsy. It could look more fibrotic, types 1, 2, and 3, uh, NSIP, 3 being a little bit more fibrotic and 1 being cellular. The CTs look a little bit different. The patients tend to do a little differently depending on their type of biopsy as well. A couple of cases, actually three cases of NSIP, and this is actually your second unknown as well. The classic HRCT description of NSIP, peripheral subpleural reticulation and ground glass opacity. In this case, the ground glass opacity is really a combination of the peripheral interstitial thickening, the reticulation, as well as an active alveolitis. There are activated cells, lymphocytes, and whatnot sitting in the alveoli just waiting to be washed out by a pulmonologist to make a diagnosis. You can see an example here as well. There's little traction bronchiectasis. This is a fibrotic process. It's an activated cellular and fibrotic process. The more fibrosis there, usually the worse the patient's prognosis. And you can actually see areas of consolidation. And I threw this last case in. I just want to make one point because I'm going to discuss organizing pneumonia in just a second. Don't be surprised if you happen to see NSIP looking a little bit like organizing pneumonia when you're dealing with this alphabet soup. In probably one-fourth or more of cases, if you biopsy the patients, separate areas of the lung will have a separate process going on. So this, to some of you who know the IPs already, this may look a little bit more like organizing pneumonia. Biopsy this patient here, you may get organized pneumonia. You biopsy them up here, you may get an SIP. The important thing is to differentiate reversible disease from irreversible disease. Who really cares if you got the case of OP right versus an SIP? It doesn't matter too much as long as you know what these diseases are associated with, which I'm coming up on, and that they're reversible, potentially reversible diseases that can be treated with immunosuppression. That's all in distinction to usual interstitial pneumonia, which we can't do much about. An SIP often, not invariably, but often will respond to treatment. Patchy subpleural ground glass opacity, reticulation, and area of consolidation as well. The patient was biopsied, NSIP was shown on pathology, treated heavily with steroids, and you can see a lot of this opacity is regressed. It usually doesn't clean up perfectly, but it definitely regresses, and the patient's physiology usually improves as a consequence also. So organizing pneumonia. Granulation tissue polyps and bronchioles with little foci of organizing pneumonia. Used to go by the name bronchiolitis obliterans, organizing pneumonia, now it goes by the name organizing pneumonia, cryptogenic being idiopathic organizing pneumonia, or you can have organizing pneumonia associated with certain diseases. And it's important to know these diseases because you may see a biopsy on somebody or hear about a biopsy. The patient has an OP pattern on radiography. You have to remember it may be a certain clinical context associated. And I've seen all these diseases manifest first with either OP or NSIP. Collagen vascular diseases, so it's part of rheumatoid arthritis, part of lupus, that sort of thing. Certain infections may get an organizing pneumonia response. This will be treated with steroids, not with antibiotics. Bone marrow transplant, graft versus host disease. Seen more than a couple of cases of Wegener's granulomatosis manifest with OP in the lung as a reaction to injury. So you get that biopsy, you have to recognize that maybe what you're looking at when you're seeing OP on a chest radiograph or a CT scan, it may be idiopathic or it could be associated with a systemic disease. And then there's a manifestation of toxic inhalations, and there's a whole laundry list of things beyond this that OP can be associated with. Think of the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias as reactions to injury, and every patient's a little bit different. Some patients may not react to a noxious stimulus. Other patients may get an NSIP reaction. Some patients an OP-type reaction. And all these diseases can occur idiosyncratically as well. Idiosyncratic gets the word cryptogenic in front of the words organized pneumonia. So what's it look like on HRCT? 
the classic pattern of organizing pneumonia, whether it's associated with something or whether it's cryptogenic, is patchy air space disease, consolidation or ground glass opacity, either one, with a characteristic distribution. Not seen in every case, but when it's there, it's something you want to latch on to. Subplural, way out in the periphery of the lung, usually out next to or touching the pleural surfaces. It may be wrapped around a bronchus as well, peribronchiolar. You may see nodules, about 15% of cases, COP is more or less a nodular pattern. And rarely you'll see reticulation, and you'll mistake it for NSIP, and that's totally okay. Doesn't matter as long as you've made the diagnosis of a potentially reversible process and the patient got biopsied and worked up accordingly. You should not see effusions or lymphadenopathy. You've got a second process going on if you see organized pneumonia with that pattern. Pretty typical example, this is your third unknown, I believe, peripheral. Consolidation, you can see this is out in the peripheral third of the lung, and it's actually distinctly subpleural here where it's actually touching the pleural surface. It's also nicely peribronchiolar here, wrapped around a bronchus. This particular pattern is very strongly suggestive of organizing pneumonia, and it also looks very similar to eosinophilic pneumonia. You think of one, think of the other. If you mention OP, think of eosinophilic pneumonia and vice versa, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. They look identical on radiography. Leave that up to the pathologist and the pulmonologist to distinguish the two. So in terms of interstitial disease, looking at nodular patterns now, random nodules, and I'm sure Rick went over this somewhat, I'll go over it again. When you look at small nodules on a uh, HRCT scan, again, we're categorizing them according to their behavior with reference to the secondary lobule, and also on a more macroscopic scale. When you look at these nodules, they're gonna come out to and touch the pleural surface, like Rick said, but you're also gonna see quite a few that are gonna be central lobular in location. So there's really no predominance with regard to the secondary lobule or the lung. You'll see them in the middle of the lobule, you'll see them in the periphery of the lobule. You'll see them all throughout the lung, anterior, middle, posterior lung, all fairly rel relatively affected. There's not really a predominance in one area or another. And that's how you make the diagnosis of a random nodule on CT scanning. And really on chest radiograph too. This is a pretty typical example of miliary tuberculosis. You can see little nodules out here touching the pleura. Some of them don't quite touch the pleura and those are more central lobular in location. A bunch of them here littered along the fissure, some in the periphery of the lung, some actually in the central lobular regions of the lung, and the anterior lung and posterior lung relatively equally affected, maybe a little bit more posterior, sometimes a little bit more basilar predominant, since this is usually a hematogenous process. Miliary tuberculosis, either MTB, mycobacterial tuberculosis, or non-tuberculous mycobacteria, and fungi. Those are the two big infections that are going to look like this. Viruses can do it, but they're going to be remarkably rare. When you see this in practice, it's usually one of those two organisms. Fungus, any old fungus can do this, or TB. Sarcoid, you heard a little bit about last hour. Etiology is unknown. non casein and granuloma, so it's a granulomatous pneumonitis. Hits a lot of different organs, but mostly the lung. Lung's involved in almost all the cases. And most cases are going to go away on their own, but some will progress to fibrosis. HRCT, small, well-defined nodules in a certain distribution that Rick referred to, and I'll go over again with you now, a perilymphatic distribution. These are nodules that occur where the lymphatics occur, along bronchovascular bundles, fissures, septa, and in the, secondary second, in the center of the secondary lobule because there's lymph tissue moving along the central lobular bronchus, so you will see nodules in that area. They won't predominate in the center of the lobule. That's the difference. Sarcoid tends to have an upper lobe predominance. Nodules are usually bilateral, but they're often clustered in small areas as well. Perilymphatic distribution, nodules, if you look at the fissures, the nodules are going to be littering the fissures right along the septa, along bronchovascular st structures, and a few in the center of the lobule and along septa here. Here's a central lobular nodule, here's another one. That will not be the predominant manifestation. Most of the time it's going to be mostly along the fissure, and it's not going to be widespread throughout the lung. It's going to be fairly localized, unlike random disease. Pretty typical example here, sarcoidosis. When you find these small nodules and you look at the fissural surfaces, you can see the costal pleura and a little bit right here on the major fissure, major fissure on the right side as well. Small nodules touching them, that tells you you're dealing with either perilymphatic uh, or a random process. And the way to distinguish perilymphatic and random is look at the distribution with regard to the anterior, posterior, upper, and lower lungs, a global distribution. Sarcoid will be upper lobe predominant, Random diseases are not going to have an upper lobe predominance. Sarcoid will also be very patchy, too. You can see it's pretty abnormal here and a little less abnormal here. That's what we mean by patchy. Some areas are heavily involved, other areas less heavily involved. You tend not to see that patchiness with random diseases, but you do see it with paralymphatic diseases like sarcoid. Hypersensitivity you also heard about. Of course, there's acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis. We rarely image those patients. It just looks like diffuse lung injury if you do. We usually see the patients in chronic and uh, subacute stages. We'll see areas of hyperlucency on lung due to altered uh, blood volume. 
You'll see air trapping. This is a small airway centered process, so you'll see air trapping on expiratory imaging. The head cheese sign, which I'll explain to you in just a second. Areas of ground glass opacity and mosaic perfusion on the same inspiratory scan image. This is, you can see this in subacute. You also tend to see it a little bit more, I think, in a chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis where there's more extensive fibrosis laid down. So hypersensitivity pneumonitis is a small airway disease and it's mostly characterized by uh, s uh, ground glass nodules or at least nodules in a central lobular distribution. So distinguishing central lobular from perilymphatic from random is important. And you do so by looking at the fissural surfaces and the costal pleural surfaces, and the nodules will come up to but not quite touch the pleural surfaces in most cases. So you'll see varying sizes of nodules coming up to but sparing that subpleural region slightly. If you see branching configurations, then you're dealing with tree and bud. That's usually an infection. That's not hypersensitivity pneumonitis. I threw it in here just to remember, so you remember that tree and bud is a form of central lobular nodule. You may see big nodules, small nodules, or even clusters of rosettes. Pretty classic case of what subacute hypersensitivity pneumonitis looks like. These nodules, if you look at all of them, they're coming right up to but not quite touching the pleural surface, so you can make the diagnosis of a central lobular process. Then you add on extra descriptors that help you narrow in on the differential. These nodules are somewhat ground glass or hazy in attenuation, and they're rather diffusely or randomly distributed. They're all over the place. I don't, I don't want to use the word random here. I'll say the word diffuse because I don't want to confuse you on your nodule distributions. Diffuse meaning the upper, mid, and lower lungs are relatively equally affected. So if I showed you lower images, this patient had the same process going on down low. When you say I've got ground glass central lobular nodules with a diffuse distribution, you pretty much told yourself it's subacute hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Very few other things will look just like this. Chronic hypersensitivity can be a little bit of a fooler. You may see some of these nodules, but you tend to see more coarse fibrosis, traction bronchiectasis, a little coarser reticulation, areas of mosaic perfusion like this. This area gets more fibrotic. It tends to retract, and it expands the lung next to it. As it does so, it'll pull this out and make it look a little bit more hyperlucent. There's areas of kind of normal-ish looking lung here, very infiltrated lung here, and areas of hyperlucent lung all on the same inspiratory image. That's what we mean by the head cheese sign, a conglomeration of increased and decreased and normal, uh, decreased opacity lung with normal lung all on the same inspiratory scan image. Pretty specific for hypersensitivity. There are a few other things that do it, but it really is suggestive of chronic hypers hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Let me finish up with one other a uh, feature on HRCT scan that I think is worth looking for for interstitial disease, and that's extensive linear components, in particular tumor infiltration of the septa. I showed you a case of pulmonary edema. The other major disease, is the, uh, disease that causes interlobular septal thickening is lymphangitic carcinomatosis. Infiltration of the septa with a little bit of nodularity like this. This little nodule here, you can give one nodule away to the septa just because it's a pulmonary vein. So every time you see a little bump on a septa, you don't want to say, ah, it's PLC, next case. You can get a pulmonary vein in there. You want to look for real nodules like we see down here. Here's a septa, a bunch of septa strung together with large nodules sitting on top of these septa in close contact. This is very typical of an interstitial process infiltrating the interstitium with nodular linear components. And you can add other features to get a specific diagnosis. Lymphangetic spread tends to be a little more lower low predominant. It's thought that there's some element of hematogenous dissemination to the interstitium is responsible for this disease. You may see lymphadenopathy, you may see pleural effusion, and the disease is often asymmetric or sometimes even frankly unilateral. So it looks a little different than sarcoidosis. Also, and importantly, when you're distinguishing sarcoid and lymphangetic spread of carcinoma, lymphangetic spread of carcinoma is not a fibrosing illness. It's not a fibrosing process at all. So you don't tend to see traction bronchiectasis and architectural distortion like you often do in sarcoidosis. That's one of the ways you can distinguish some of the more common abnormalities. Note the gross asymmetry here. Sarcoid tends not to be this asymmetric. Diffuse infiltration with linear interstitial abnormalities in the hilum. Hilum is also enlarged and gross asymmetry with the opposite side. Fairly typical of lymphangetic carcinomatosis. Probably lung and breast overall are the big ones that do this. GI tumors, particularly uh, pancreas and stomach, tend to do it. And cervical carcinoma and lymphoma are probably the major list, but just about any tumor can do this if it wants to. This is an important diagnosis to make because, number one, it's obviously going to change the patient's treatment algorithm. And if you make it presumptively on, on the strength of uh, a good HRCT interpretation, a lot of patients won't get a biopsy to prove it. So when you